awesome. And we're back at the Global AI Student Conference. And we are here with our very next speaker, who is Kevin McFall, doing a talk on disaster risk monitoring using satellite imagery. Kevin, it's so nice to see you. Yeah, so cool to be with you guys today. Yeah, and how are you doing? And where are you tuning in from? <laughs> I'm tuning in from uh, the southeast corner of Germany, uh, near Salzburg, between Salzburg and Munich. It's a beautiful, sunny, snowy day here. Oh, that's amazing. It sounds, first of all, that sounds absolutely beautiful. And initially I was like, oh no, are you from the United States? Because it would be like 4 a.m. <laughs> there right now. <laughs> well, we're super Indeed excited not. to get started with your talk on disaster risk monitoring. Feel free to take it away. Okay, cool. Um, I just want to make sure um, I have an hour. Is that right? Or I just want to make sure I get the pacing right. Yes. Yes. You have an hour. Sorry about that. Um, I'm back. Um, let me go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and start and by sharing the screen here. Um, let's see. There we go. Um, so, ah, you know what? First, I need to go in the chat because what I have to present for you guys today is actually um, an interactive lab. You know, I'll be presenting this and I'm going to be giving you a connection to be able to work through these exercises on your own. So um, give me one second here. Let me switch my presenter. So do you see this? Do, see, does everybody see the screen? Is that is that good? Yes, we can see the screen. OK, cool. Um, I want to drop in the chat for you a link that I'm going to show here in a little bit. Um, so I want everybody to uh, to be able to see that link. Um, because that will take you to the hands-on activities that I'm going to show you uh, today. So um, the idea, I, I want to first start off talking a little bit about the problem statement and the, the, the uh, sort of idea of what we're trying to solve and what you can learn about today uh, through this course. So the idea is disaster risk monitoring uh, using satellite imagery. And this is sort of like an overview slide. You know, you might have like the satellite that's going around the Earth and collecting uh, images uh, in in the actual data that we're going to use today is for uh, is actually radar and it sort of visualizes the radar to make it look like a picture. So you might think like you're you're seeing a picture, but it's actually radar data. And so the idea is is you have uh, you've got this uh, satellite that is giving you all of these you know the Google Earth and all of these pictures of the world, and we have to be able to do, there, there's got to be a way to use this to do good things. You know, there's all sorts of disasters that happen. There's landslides, there's, you know, the Hawaii, the, the uh, uh, volcanoes erupting in Hawaii now. Uh, and we're going to focus today in this work, in this little uh, course here on, um, on floods and trying to prevent floods. And so the idea is you're collecting this information from the satellites. It's getting stored in some sort of data center. And you want to build a machine learning, a deep learning model uh, to be able to do something with that. So you're going to train this number two is, you know, training your deep learning model. You're going to have a bunch of different models in repository that you can do something with that, that will detect a flood or detect a landslide or, or anything like that. And you're going to use this to then deploy it and manage the model being run, because if you're gonna to wanna to do something real to help people, you're gonna want this to be happening in real time, okay? So you're gonna to need to have some sort of a tool to be able to manage and get this to happen in basically near real time so that you can get immediate updates of what's going on. And that's gonna feed back here, okay, uh, across four uh, to get, uh, you know, watching the model performance, seeing how fast it is, making sure everything's working the right way. And of course, you can go back and, and fix things. And this is can be an iterative loop where you're going to uh, make improvements and get everything to work the way you want. But then essentially, when it's in operation on this number six here, you're going to be getting these um, inference results. And inference is just a fancy word for, as you know, for, uh, you know, using your model to make a decision. And then that can go to a front end where maybe there's scientists or uh, or, or um, people in government that are trying to manage response that can use it. Or you can even push that out to user devices, uh, you know, give a, a warning to somebody's mobile phone. So this is sort of like the bigger picture 
of how you might build one of these systems. Now, what we're going to focus mostly on today is essentially two, three, and four. Uh, well, I guess really two, three, and six, really, where you're going to build a model, you're going to uh, get it ready to be deployed, and then you're going to uh, and then you're going to go ahead and uh, use the you know do inference on the results and get something that you can work with. All right, so that's sort of the overview and. Uh, these are, you know, these pictures on the top are the, what I was saying before is these radar images that are sort of converted into something that looks like um, a, a picture, okay, that we can sort of look at. It's, it's not really RGB, but, but it, it basically looks like an image to us. And the goal of the model that we want to build is to take these images and be able to segment them, okay? And to segment a, an image means that you're going to color pixels, basically classify pixels to know the white pixels are water and the black pixels are not, okay? And so that's the type of model we want to build. And I'll talk here in a bit about how we're going to use a unit to do this. Um, but this is the overall picture of what we want to do. Now, that link that I put in the chat, uh, that's going to get you to uh, the NVIDIA's Deep Learning Institute course. And this course, Disaster Risk Monitoring Using Satellite Imagery, is a free course for everybody. So you guys can get in there, you can share it with your friends, everybody can work through this. And uh, as you'll see here in a minute, that you will wor be working with the code. There's Jupyter Labs that you can go line by line and, and work through the code to understand how things are going. Now, I wanna mention this because you know, essentially, I want to do a little bit of a deep dive into the technology behind the UNet. I'm going to talk a lot about computer vision because this course is essentially freestanding and you don't even really need me. You know, I could be quiet right now and you could take the link and you can go and, and uh, you know, watch, watch that link and go through everything yourself. Um, so I don't want to repeat the things that are in the course because there's a video that explains everything and the code is very well explained in the Jupyter Notebooks. But I want to make sure that you're able to uh, unlock this so that if you have any trouble, I can, I can help you here towards the end, end of the hour that we have together. So this is the link that I put in, uh, in the chat, um, and hopefully you all can get that. If, uh, if you're having trouble, you can go to courses.nvidia.com, uh, and if you go into the self-paced courses, these, uh, there's these online courses, and then you'll find it. Otherwise, you can use this direct link, and I put that in the chat. So uh, once you get into this website, you'll need to um, register. Um, you'll need to create a developer, an NVIDIA developer account. It's really straightforward. You just have to put in your email address. And, and that's like when you click here uh, to, uh, to log in, it will bring you to this website. Uh, or you can do courses.nvidia.com slash join. But either way, it'll get you here. You put in your email address. Uh, there'll be a little bit of a form to fill out. Uh, do make sure you use an email address that you have access to because it will ask you for a confirmation, okay? Now, once you get yourself logged in there and click on enroll here, once you get, uh, let me go back here a second. Once you click on enroll now, once you're logged in, it brings you to this page here, uh, which is the course. Um, and once you get here, you can click on this direct, Disaster Risk Monitoring Using Satellite Imagery to move on to the first uh, first page. And it brings you here. And this is where I say there's a video that explains all of the background much better than I could in terms of uh, the way the, you know, the, the problem statement. Um, and like I said, I'm going to take a bit of a bit more of a deep dive into the UNet here in a minute once I get you started. And so you'll click down here on this Start button, and that will spin up uh, a Microsoft Azure uh, instance where all of the hardware that you're going to need, all the GPUs, all of the all of the computing hardware you'll need to run the course will be running on a Microsoft Azure uh, virtual machine. So you don't need any any extra hardware uh, to get in here, uh, and uh, it's great. You you won't have to worry about that. Um, and then once you click on Start. It might take five to 10 minutes uh, for it to uh, allocate the resources, but be patient. It'll spin around uh, for a while, but that's why I'm letting you know in the beginning how to do this so that could be sort of running in the background uh, while you're listening to the stuff I have to say uh, about the actual technology here in a minute. 
Um, and then you click here on this launch button. You'll notice that there is a timer. It will kick you out after five hours, um, and you have a total of 17 hours um, in the virtual machine. Uh, you know, it does cost some money to, to run those, um, so we give you 17 hours to be able to work through that. It should be plenty enough time uh, for you to work through all the exercises. So when you click then on that launch button, that will bring you into the Jupyter Lab environment. And it's really self-explanatory. It'll work, walk you through here. It tells you, you know, the introduction. If you haven't worked in Jupyter Notebooks before, it'll show you how to do that. Um, so that's sort of, uh, you know, the, the process that you're going to do to get into the course and get into all these, you know, there's all these different Jupyter Notebooks with code in there that you're going to modify and play around with. And essentially, this environment will teach you how to use the different technologies uh, to uh, you know, build the building blocks for that sort of overview uh, that we're looking at. Okay, all right. So that's going to get you into uh, into the course, and you can work on that now. Um, it actually is uh, sort of um, recommends it's about a four hour a four hour long uh, uh, course. And again, I don't want to hash over the details because you can spend the time there. What I'd much rather talk about is computer vision tasks in general and then get into segmentation in specific because the course does a great job of walking you through how to use the technology, but it doesn't talk a lot about the specifics of what's going on under the hood. And I thought that some of you might really enjoy a walk through com convolutional neural networks and how to use that for the segmentation task that we're interested in today. So just as a bit of an overview, there's several different types of computer vision tasks. The easiest is, uh, is classification, where essentially you've got an image and you want to say, is this image the class that I'm looking for or is it not? So for example, on your phone, you, you, know, you put that little bounding box you know, around, your, around your face when you're in your camera app, right? So you might want to detect, is, is there a face in this picture or not? So you know, that's a face, that's a face, that's not a face, okay? So classification is assigning a label to the entire image, okay? Oops, sorry. So um, there's other tasks that you can do as well, okay? That's detection. And detection is like what I was saying in your, in your camera app, that it's going to put that bounding box Hey there, Kevin. I think your audio just yep. cut out. Oh, it's back. I think I'm back. Yay, yeah, I'm awesome. Sorry. sorry about that. <laughs> so, uh, so object detection is going to tell you not just the label, um, but it's also going to give you a localization for it, okay, with the bounty box. Now, what we're interested in is segmentation, and essentially segmentation is a pixel-wise classification that every single pixel in the image gets a classification. So you're getting a much better boundary on the face than just a bounding box that's rectangular. And that's what we're trying to do today is segmentation, okay? Now, there's several different kinds of segmentation. What we're after is sort of the, the simplest version in a way, semantic segmentation, where you're gonna, you know, all of the, all the pixels that have to do with cats are going to be one, one color and all the pixels of the background or the table are going to be other colors. For us, um, it's going to be water is one color and everything else is going to be another color. Um, there are things like instance segmentation, and that's a combination of detection and semantic segmentation where, okay, you identify with a bounding box each of your objects, but then you find what pixels are for each one of those instances. And so now we can see three different cats instead of one big blob of, of catness, okay? Um, and then, of course, panoptic segmentation, that's like the combination of everything, even the background, not just the, not just the objects we're trying to find are being segmented, but the background as well, okay? But for our purposes, semantic segmentation works just fine when we're trying to do water and not water. Now, um, I'm an old guy. I've been doing machine learning and deep learning for many, many years, and I was doing machine learning before deep learning existed. And one of the great things about deep learning is that the features are essentially calculated for you in a neural network. In the old days, we would have to do traditional computer vision to sort of 
take the image, you know, this image of a flower and extract information out of it. Back then we didn't have powerful enough computers to be able to just feed the entire image in and let the computer figure everything out. And so, for example, if we're trying to say segment this, this flower and identify all of the pixels that are inside the flower, we might want to know the edges. And you can see, you know, in this image, we've identified where the edges are. And then we can maybe do like a flood fill or something like that to find, you know, to segment the image. Maybe we're trying to identify what color this rose is. And so maybe we do a threshold on the red, on the R pixels in our RGB image. And then we can say, oh, are there very big blobs? You know, are, are there giant blobs of red in here? Oh, that must be a red flower, okay? Or maybe we're trying to identify how many floors there are to this building. And we apply a Huff transform or something like that to identify where the lines are. And then we can count the floors. And so this is what you had to do in the olden days to cal calculate these features before you fed that into your neural network. Now, of course, these days with convolutional neural networks and, of course, vision transformers and other things that are coming, we don't need to do that. We can just feed the entire image in. Now, I wanted to go ahead and talk about that the, those old days because this idea about convolutions existed long before deep learning. It was a traditional computer vision technique, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how convolution works, okay? So here's a three by three kernel, okay? And essentially, this is just a little matrix, and it has values in this matrix. In this case, I made them to be binary values. Of course, in normally, they'd be floating point uh, And I'm back. Oh, yeah, you're back. That. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, it's a little glitchy today. Um, in any case, let's say you've got an image like this, okay? And uh, it also has ones and zeros, just to be simple. And we take this kernel, and we're going to put it over the first overlap of the first upper left-hand part. And these maroon values are the kernel values, and the bigger values are the ones of the image. And what we're going to do is we're going to do an element-wise multiply. Here's one by one. Here's one by one. Here's one by one. Here's So there's four one by ones, and the rest are zeros. And that four will give me this pixel. And so then we're going to shift that kernel over one pixel and do the same thing to get the new value. Shift it over again to get the new value. And then we're going to keep rastering that. Bring it down to the next one. Shift it across. Shift it across. And we're going to keep convolving this kernel over my input image, and it will calculate a new image. It's what we call a convolve feature or a feature map, okay? And this is a new feature. By using this kernel, it will tell me new information about my image. Now, you'll notice that this image is a little bit smaller because the kernel had to sort of be inside the image. And you could pad the outside of that image with zeros, and then you could make the feature map be the same in this kernel and transforming the input image into something new. Now, what might some of these kernels look like? These ones are called Sobel kernels, and they give you essentially the horizontal derivative or the vertical derivative to see how much the image is changing in the horizontal or vertical direction. And that could be interesting for us. So let's say, for example, we've got these very simple images, and we want to, to classify which of these has a square. And the squares, well, it's got a horizontal, a horizontal line at the top and the bottom and a vertical line on the left and right. So those Sobel kernels could help me to be able to see whether there's vertical or horizontal lines in my image. So this is applying the Sobel X to each of the three images. This is applying the Sobel Y to each of these images. And as you can see, by applying this kernel, we're getting a new image that tells me something about the previous image. Here, we've just got a whole bunch of mess in it. There's not really any lines because it's more like a circle than a line. Okay, And here I see there's vertical lines, but not really horizontal lines. So we're starting to get information out of our image that we can use to classify. Now, 
there's nine by nine, there's 81 pixels in this image. And surely we can tell, if you look at this image, we can tell that there's lines there without all 81 of those pixels. So we could reduce the resolution of our image to make things easier and actually faster to compute because it's smaller. And what we could do here is use a max And we could look and see what is the brightest pixel in that three by three area and make this entire area that color. And then we could move to here. What's the brightest color? Ooh, that's very white. What's the brightest color here? Oh, well, that's all pretty much the same, okay? And so we could do this max pooling and it makes our lives easier and simpler and faster because we don't need all of the resolution in the original image. Now, it's pretty easy to see, well, look, Let's look on the left side. How bright are these pixels? Let's look on the right. How bright are those? Let's look at the top. How bright, how bright, how bright, etc. And so essentially, if it's a square, if the average pixel value on the left and the right and the top and the bottom, if all of them are high, then that should mean that it's a square. Okay, and so I'm walking you through here as a very simple example and sort of, you know, hand designing this program. I'm not doing any machine learning here, but I'm showing you essentially the process that the, that the convolutional neural network is going to go through. Now, how do I go, uh, go about this process of saying, if those pixel values are over a particular threshold, make a decision? And that's where our activation functions come in. Now, this step function, the blue one, that's the one that we originally used in the very first perceptron networks, the very first neural networks. And they use that because that's what happens in our brain. Our brains are binary. Either our neurons fire or they don't. If they collect enough information into, into their inputs, then they'll fire. And if they don't, they won't. And so that's what the step function is. Okay. Um, but as you probably know, these neural networks operate with back propagation. And in backpropagation, we need to have the derivative of that value, okay? And the, we need the derivative of our activation function, okay? And if, if you look at the derivative of the step function, it's zero everywhere because it's flat, and then it's infinite at an input value of zero. So if we're looking at the gradient or the derivative of the step function, it's either zero or infinite, and that's not going to be very helpful. And that's where the sigmoid comes in. It's basically a nice, smooth, differentiable step function. It goes from one down to zero, okay? But it does it smoothly and differentially, okay? Now, that's great, but if we look at its derivative, the largest derivative that it has is one quarter. It's a small number, okay? And in deep neural networks, we have many layers. We maybe have, I mean, you've seen hundreds of layers in some of these deep networks. And if I'm gonna multiply 0.25 times 0.25 times 0.25, or even worse, what about like 0.01? If we multiply all these small numbers together, it gets very small, and that's what we call vanishing gradient. And that's why so often we use the ReLU function. Now, first of all, it's super simple. It's very easy to calculate, but it also has a, a derivative that's one for an entire half of its input range, okay? So yes, the ReLU is simple to calculate. It's faster, especially for deep networks, but it's also less susceptible to vanishing gradients. So, you know, the whole reason I was talking about this was because I wanted to, I wanted to talk about, you know, setting a threshold and, and firing, okay? And that's what we're gonna use. We're gonna use the step function for that. But if we're gonna do back propagation, we'd have to use one of these others. Now, all that's important with the activation function is that there's non-linearity, okay? The ReLU is, is piecewise linear, but overall it's non-linear. And that's the only important thing about these activation functions is that they have non-linearity in them. So normally we'd use a ReLU, um, but I'm gonna talk here about using just a step function because we're not using back propagation here. So here's our input square. We're gonna do convolution on it. We're gonna do a Sobel X and a Sobel Y. Okay, and then we're going to do max pooling on it to reduce its size and make it easier to handle. And then we're going to take all of those 18 different values and flatten them out and feed them into my neural network. 
okay? And this top part is, the, is telling me about the left, the right, the top, and the bottom. And so what we can do then is take each one of those. We want to take the average of each of those. So we're going to multiply each of them by a third and add them together, okay? And then we're going to apply a threshold. We're going to take a constant value and subtract, say, 0.75. What I want, if it's a perfect square, it's going to be perfectly white. It's going to be a value of 1 perfectly. But it's not perfectly 1. So if it's above 0.75, we'll go ahead and say it's a square. So we're going to take the average of them and subtract 0.75. And as long as the average of all of them sums to be more than 0.75, then I'm going to get an output. Okay, and that output, if, that, if that's greater than 0, my step function is going to fire. If it's less than 0, then the, then the uh, threshold dominates, and it doesn't fire. And so then I'm going to take all of those, combine them together. I want them to equally contribute, so I'm going to give them all ones, and I'm going to compare them to, say, 3.5. Is it close to We want it to be 4. We want all four of them to be. And then we're going to, again, set another a, a step function, and if it passes through that, then it's square. So what we have here is some convolutions. We have some pooling, then we flatten, and then we have fully connected layers. Now, this isn't truly fully connected because all of these inputs are not feeding into each one of these nodes, but you could imagine if all of these guys had zero weights multiplying into that node, then you could make this to be fully connected, okay? So we've got a fully connected layer here, assuming some of those have zero weights, and then we have a fully connected layer here. All four of these feed into that. So we've got a convolution part that extracts the features, and then we have a fully connected part that makes the classification, okay? Now, I did all of this by making human decisions to make this work. But what the convolutional neural network is going to do is these values in the convolution kernels and these values for the weights and the biases those are going to be what are automatically updated through the supervised training technique. So I don't have to, as a human designer anymore, calculate these features. This convolutional neural network does that by itself. And that's what's really cool. So this whole architecture, we can sort of su summarize it down by having a 9 by 9 input, then two convolution uh, feature maps that are 9 by 9, and then max pooling down to 3 by 3 then flattening 18, then having fully connected 4, fully connected 1 at the output, and we're good to go, okay? Now, what are some of the, you know, that's a, a dummy problem. What are some of the real architectures, okay? That one's very simple, okay? Here is something, was this is essentially the very first convolutional neural network, one of the things that, that Jan LeCun is very famous for. And this came out actually in 1998, which is amazing how old it is. Um, and... Here you can see it's much more complicated than what we have, but it essentially follows the same process, okay? It has input to convolution feature maps to um, max pooling or some sort of pooling, subsampling you call it, okay? More convolutions, okay? More, uh, more pooling, and then fully connected layer, fully connected layer. And in this case, uh, you know, maybe they're trying to tell the difference between the, the numbers zero through nine. That, that's why there would be 10 outputs, okay? And so that's a very simple convolutional neural network. Of course, uh, AlexNet in 2014 became very famous. Uh, that's when deep learning really started happening. And, uh, and we really, really were moving into the, the deep learning uh, you know, revolution, okay? Now, that's for classification. How would you do detection? The simplest way is with a sliding window search where you have this window move across your image and you perform classification. Okay, so we got Hey Kevin. We're back here. Oh, we're back. Awesome. Yeah. You you want to yeah, yeah, yeah. you want to um, take so a pause to reboot me, your machine? 
No, I don't think that's the problem. I think the only other option is going to my phone, but then I can't do the presentation. So I, I don't know. I I I think um, I don't think a reboot is going to help. So I think we must strike might power through. Awesome. Well, you're back, so you've got this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So um, so we have this question. In this example, applying the convolution seemed to blur the lines. Those lines got blurred. Now, um, and yes, uh, they did get blurred in a way, um, but the important piece was to change this Im input image into something we could use, okay? And yeah, it got blurred, but there still was white there. And I guess the really big takeaway is we as humans will pick this kernel and we'll get this blurred result, but what's going to happen is the computer will automatically choose what these kernel values are. And if it's blurred and it still gets a good result, it won't care. It'll just keep, it'll keep changing these values until it gets some sort of feature that helps it get the output. And so, yeah, this is an imperfect example with a human selecting the values and it's just a dummy, dummy example. But the beauty is, is that the out the, the the supervised learning technique will op optimize what these kernel values will be so that it won't be blurred or it gets it at least what it needs to be able to get the right example the right answer. So it's a really good answer, and I think the sh the sort of a good question. The short answer is the the network will adjust them to get just the right fuzziness or clearness or whatever it needs it will optimize itself and that is something amazing and to be honest that is what got me back into doing machine learning and deep learning i did a lot of machine learning then i got into robotics and then deep learning came around is like hey this is really cool you need to go start working more in it so so uh that point is, is really really interesting so there's this sliding window search, which, as you can imagine, uh, is going to end up being a little bit slow because I have to do lots of, you know, small. And so then our CNN came about and what it did is it did region proposal. And with region proposal, it didn't try every square possible, but it had a network to try and predict which places were the best to be. And that was a bit more efficient. And then about two years later, YOLO and uh, an SSD came around and they used a single network. Uh, you know, you only look once. That's what YOLO stands for. it once one pass you don't have to do lots of different things okay and so um that is uh you know that's sort of where the state of the art is for the most part you know there's been uh you know improvements on all of these um, but that's basically how you do detection okay all right now we want to get to segmentation and to talk about segmentation most all of the networks that of segmentation networks are based on the idea of an autoencoder and this is a image of a vanilla, very simple autoencoder. The purpose of an autoencoder is you put your input in and you want the network to output the exact same thing that you So the autoencoder's purpose is to take the input and get it to get the same thing come at the output. And the reason this is interesting is the bottleneck. And essentially, we take the large amount of input data and we want to make it into a smaller space. We want to encode it and you know, essentially boil down all the important information. And if, it, if this auto encoder can make the input smaller and then recreate the output pretty well, then it must have learned the important features of the inputs, okay? And basically this, this network is trained by looking at the difference between the input and the output called the reconstruction error and the weights of the network are optimized to make that reconstruction error as small as possible. 
So this idea of taking the input and encoding it into something smaller is how we're also going to do semantic segmentation. Okay, so this is a an, an image of a unit. Anybody want to guess why they call it a unit? <laughs> it looks a little bit like a U. Okay, and in the unit, what we do is we take our input image, we perform a bunch of convolutions, we do max pooling or some sort of pooling to make it smaller, go through a bunch more convolutions, make it smaller, more convolutions, smaller, more convolutions smaller until at this point we have represented our image as a vector okay well almost a vector it's 32 by by 1024 um but it's reasonably small okay and so we've got it as this vector and then we're going to upsample we're going to make it bigger we're going to do the opposite of a max pooling and then we're going to do more convolutions opposite of max pooling make it bigger more convolutions Max uh, 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 un unpooling, you could call it, uh, and then convolutions, unpooling convolutions. And then in the output, we're not trying to get the exact same thing as the input, but rather we're trying to get a segmented image. So it's similar. The output's going to look similar to the input, but it's going to be segmented instead. Now, one important piece to this unit architecture is skip connections, where it takes things from the input side and it copies them over directly. So the original image essentially here is being copied over and concatenated or added in here. And these skip connections do two things. One of them is it allows information to bypass that bottleneck, okay? Because there might be important information here that could be useful over there. The other piece too is that it helps us reduce the vanishing gradient because this value is copied over all of the all of the relus that it has to pass through in here, all of those activation functions has to pass through, get skipped by. And the gradient can pass very quickly without having to be multiplied by the derivative of the activation function. So these skip and they help carry information forward. So this unit is the architecture that we're going to use in our segmentation, in, in our uh, network problem for doing the, uh, for doing the, um... so that gives us an overview of the unit architecture okay and what i the one last thing i want to talk about is how does this happen this up sampling we already talked about how the max pooling can make things smaller but how do we make things And this blog here talks about some really good ways it's a little bit longer. Um, but there's a couple different upsampling methods. There's nearest neighbors, interpolation, max unpooling, and this is basically the opposite of pooling. But there's no parameters for the network to optimize. What we can do instead is we transpose convolution, where we take our input and we apply a kernel to make things bigger. We've got a two by two input image, and we want to make it a three by three larger image. We take whatever value is in the kernel here, multiply it by all four of these, and put that in this place of our of our image. 
Then we take the one, we multiply the one by all those and put it here. Just put it here. And the three, all of them, and put it here. And then sum together. And so the original image looks like this guy here. This they're similar, okay, but they're modified by the kernel. And again, just like when we talked about how the blurring was happening before, and the and the convolutional neural network can choose what the kernel values are to get the right output it needs. Okay, we struggled with the connection. I'm very sorry about that. I apologize. Um, but I'm through about talking what uh, about the presentation. So what I Hey, Kevin. Would you mind leaving the like call and coming back without sharing your video? We're going to see on our end if that changes the yeah. audio at all on our end. I'm switching over to my phone, and I know that's going to work because I, I made the presentation I needed. Now, now I can just be here and answer questions for folks. So hopefully Fabulous. that will work better. All right. So um, I've walked you through all of the uh, all of the uh, essentially theory that I wanted to, and so I want you all to go to that course page now. Okay, and I, if I was on my computer, I'd be able to share the screen. But I want you to get to the uh, get to the course page and try and get yourself in there and let me just take a pause here for a bit and ask if anybody has any more questions there was one really good question that somebody posted and if you have any other questions for me um, I'd love to answer them and let me know if you're struggling getting into the course platform to be able to run the actual lab i just had a couple questions on my end for you i'd love to ask I think sure. we have time for. I know, like, one thing you brought up in, yeah. like, the, uh, let's see, in, like, the semantic segmentation is, like, you make your image, like, smaller and smaller and smaller to, like, and it takes away the detail. Is there a point where it's, like, yeah. you have to watch out before it gets <laughs> too small, too vague for you to not be able to extract any value out of it? Yeah, I think, I think there is definitely is a point of that. I mean, the thing to think about is, We've got images that are huge. I mean, you know, 4K, you know, thousands by thousands. And obviously we don't need all of that resolution to be able to see whether there's a cat eye or, you know, or whether there's a blob of water. And so, you know, using all of that resolution is just wasteful of computation. And so, yes, we want to pull down and build these features that are smaller and smaller. But I think absolutely you're right that at some point there's going to be a problem there. And if you if you go back to that architecture with the uh, with that unit, it went down. It had 32, so it had uh, thir basically 32 by 32 image, you know, 32 by 32 pieces in there. And so that's still reasonably big, but you know. You know, that's the standard unit architecture and every problem is going to be different. And, you know, maybe there are bigger features in your image that you're wanting to capture. Now, it was 32, but if you remember, I think it was like 1,024. So there were 1,024 32 by 32 images. And so if even if one of them captured something, another one that might be next to it might capture something else. So, 
in that sense, you know, you're you're capturing all this information in there. But I do think there there could, you know, it depends on the problem. If you crush too far down, especially if you make that bottleneck in the middle too small that it can't carry all the information forward, then there definitely could be a point where it gets too small. Um, and you just have to, you know, that's one of the things as as deep learning engineers you, you mess around with. You see, does this architecture work? Does tweaking this make it any better? So so certainly that's something to look for. That is I super helpful. And like your explanation was absolutely amazing. I have one more question as well. And like one thing that you were bringing up specifically in like the various upsampling methods is like there's a lot of different methods to do like the upsampling. Mm -hmm. And so as an expert, is there like a time and a place like where you know to use one specific method versus another? Um I mean, for me, the go-to one is the transpose convolution. And, mm -hmm. the, you know, of the ones that I mentioned there. And because it's the only one that is parameterized, you know, the others are good. Like, I mean, even, I mean, you know, the, the drawback of the, of the transpose convolution is that it adds more compute. And so, you know, if you're worried about compute, then mm -hmm. maybe you go to a, a straight up interpolation. You know, the interpolation is going to be pretty decent. Um, you know, and it'll probably give you good results. But if you have the computational power to be able to add in the transpose convolution, the neural network gets to pick those kernel values. I, I can't emphasize how awesome that is. You know, being a, a machine learning engineer that had to do all of that by hand, let the data decide what the upsampling should look like. Let the back propagation choose that. So for me, I'm always going to choose that transpose convolution unless I have some sort of issue with the compute not being enough. And then I'll go with something like interpolation or one of the others. Maybe even like an expansion question on that is like the level of compute needed for something like that. Like I think like, is it possible on like your standard laptop or like I know OpenAI <laughs> has like their entire backbone is in Microsoft Azure. So what type of compute right. power do we need here? Well, uh, you know, I do work for NVIDIA, so I have to mention the GPU. I, I'm legally required by that, right? Uh, you know, so, so I guess the answer is you can do a lot of this stuff on your laptop at home. And, and hey, if you've got a gaming laptop and got a GPU in there, you can use that to help accelerate things. Um, but unfortunately, in today's age, if you're going to do anything meaningful, you know, like the, the chat bot we were talking about previously, you're going to need more compute than just what you're going to have on your desktop. Now, that's where Microsoft Azure and others come in. You know, you don't have to own this anymore. You know, you know, it used to be, and I guess maybe you still might buy a giant hard drive. You know, my, you might want to have a terabyte hard drive at home. Okay. But you can get a free Google account and I don't know, what do you get now for free on Google or, or Microsoft on your OneDrive? What do you get for free on a Microsoft OneDrive? You know, yeah. you can get a lot of storage for free there. And that's sort of where we're heading now. You don't necessarily have to own your own gigantic workstation with a GPU in it. You rent some time on Microsoft Azure and get a cloud, you know, get something going in the cloud and then you only pay for what you use. You know, if you're a super heavy user, you know, like you do this for your work, yeah, maybe it's worth buying some hardware. But as a student, as a casual student, you know, there's lots of free ones out there too that you can use. So, uh, you know, so I think that's, the, you're definitely going to want more compute than just what you have on your desktop laptop. You can mess around with some toy problems and stuff, but if you're going to do something meaningful, go with something in the cloud. That is absolutely amazing. And I have some more questions, but I want to see, do we want to go back to the live training? And I can always come back to my questions if we have more time at the end. Well, I mean, what would be interesting for me is that if there's anybody having trouble getting access to that training, that's what I would like to know. And, you know, like I said, if I had my computer instead of my phone, uh, mm -hmm. I could you know, sort of do a screen share and walk you through there. But just out there in the audience, are any of you having trouble? Uh, and, and if you are, let me know and I can try to help troubleshoot you. And the other thing, you know, that's one thing I forgot to put in the chat um, is my email address. Um, it is kmcfall, K-M-C-F-A-L-L, at nvidia.com. Um, if you can please blast that out to everyone. 
Um, you know, I'd be very happy if you're having trouble getting connected to the hands-on training, you know, follow up with me afterwards. I'd be super happy to connect with you. Um, so uh, please share my email address. And uh, if there's anybody having trouble, you know, now you, we've got another 12 minutes or so, I'd love to help troubleshoot if people are having trouble getting access to that. Awesome. I'm checking on my end very quickly, and it looks like nobody's having trouble, but I think being able, like, being so helpful, sharing your email is just, it's so kind to do for all of our students listening in today. Well, I'll tell you, you know, I'm trained as a mechanical engineer. All of my degrees are mechanical engineering, and I just backed into AI by chance. It just happened to be that I, I the first job I took out of my master's degree was working with uh, computer vision and neural networks, and I got totally hooked and been doing it ever since, you know, so I'm just really excited to share, you know, my experiences and help encourage all of you students out there to, you know, follow what you find fun and interesting. And man, this deep learning stuff is so cool. And there's so many things, I mean, with the, the chat GPT and, and uh, all of the generative models, you know, uh, you know stable diffusion and all of that there there's just so many cool things and it's a great time to be in this technology and just happy to to help all of you students out there you know leapfrog into this if that's what you're interested in mm -hmm. even i know one thing that you talked about with your experience is how you were doing work in robotics but then came back to computer vision <laughs> because you found it so fascinating but have you done any work at like the intersection of both of those technologies yeah, absolutely. You know, before I came to NVIDIA, I was a university professor, I worked in a mechatronics engineering department, and I was working a lot in autonomous vehicles. And so, you know, we did a whole bunch of, you know, using object detection, uh, you know, to identify, you know, identify pedestrians or, or cars. And, and uh, you know, that is really cool now is that there's so much interesting hardware to be able to do machine learning at the edge that you can get you know, hardware to put on a robot that can, has a little GPU on it and can be able to process this stuff. So yeah, I mean, that's just, there's so many cool things you can do putting AI together with robotics. And I mean, it's kind of interesting, you know, the, the traditional, if you call it robotics approach is, you know, you build a control system and, and you do all this sort of hand engineering things you know, like that way I was showing of, of doing that square detection. You do everything by hand and can verify and have total control over everything. That's sort of the robotics approach of how you, uh, you know, build an autonomous system. And then you have the machine learning, you know, way where, you know, you can do an, a total end-to-end -end one. Like, you know, like you take the, the, uh, the picture coming out your windshield of your car and you feed that into a neural network and the output of the neural network says, you know, where, what steering angle and what throttle on the, on the pedal should you have? You know, that's sort of the total end to end one. And then of course you can have, you know, approaches in the middle that are a hybrid, but that whole tension between the robotics approach and the end to end, you know, deep learning approach, you know, that that's just a really cool battle out there to see, you know, which, which way is going to win. So there's just so many cool things to talk about. That is just, I mean, like your enthusiasm and excitement about it makes me <laughs> super excited about it. And I think I have, I'm like, I feel like we're starting to get into dangerous territory because we know you'll be on our AI and education panel later today. So I don't want to like steal yeah, all the questions that we really want to <laughs> ask you then. But with that, I think like my next question for you is like, you've been in the industry a long time, you've done academia, and now you're back in like the professional industry. And like, what are like the trends in AI in computer vision that you're really excited about? Yeah, um, well, when it comes to computer vision for AI, I mean, everybody's got to watch out for these uh, vision transformers. I mean, you know, transformers basically made LSTMs completely, uh, you know, useless overnight when it came to natural language processing. You know, that was about five years ago that suddenly, you know, recurrent neural networks were were totally useless, okay? And I think that sort of thing is coming. You know, I spent a lot of time today talking about convolutional neural networks. In a year or two, I may have to retire that, that presentation and never show it again because vision transformers are coming. So, 
you know, if, if we're talking specific about computer vision, you know, these transformers or these mixed mixed mode models where they're taking both vision as well as language or other things and combining them together, I think that's definitely where, where things are headed. Um, just in general, though, a big trend in general, not just computer vision based, I would say is ML ops. OK, mm -hmm. we spend a lot of time talking about training and building the algorithms, and that's great and necessary, but we don't spend enough time talking about actually deploying them and putting them in service and making them work and making them work well. Um, and that doesn't get, it's not nearly as sexy as, you know, training the model and messing around and hyperparameter search and all that, you know, but it's so important. You know, there's so many surveys of companies that have built a machine learning system and proven that it works, but then never get it into production. I mean, some surveys, it's as many as 80% of these models that get trained never actually get used. So if you want to be valuable to a company, figure out how that, that last step, that inference step, and, and doing the ML ops, that's where companies really, really need expertise. That is, I think, extremely insightful. I feel like I had one final question, but then it slipped my mind. <laughs> Will it come back? <laughs> Was there too many cool things to think about? I literally, that, you know what, that is so true. And you know what, it's starting to come back. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, coming back to the lab, the course that all of our viewers can do. And I would love yeah. to hear about like applying like the flood analysis and like real world world scenarios. Like obviously that's even like from my hometown in Seattle, Washington, there was flooding like I think a year ago, actually I think in January. So that's something that's very real for a lot of the world. Absolutely. And that's, that's the big challenge now. I mean, AI has proven to be useful and to be mature enough that it can solve real problems. But that's what all of you guys as students need to do. You need to take us to the next step. You've got to move beyond us old geezers that have shown that it works and, and put it out there and use it for good and find ways to you know help your communities with these things. Find ways to make these better and more ethical and 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 you know good for the planet and good for people and good for society that that's your guys challenge for the next generation is take these systems that can do good things and you guys make them and turn them into things like flood detection all these other things you know for hurricanes and whatever it happens to be there's so many things you guys can envision to use them for let's do it that is, I, th I think, an amazing, like, final message. I think, Fontini, do you have any questions? Uh, no, I think I'm okay. And we have Kevin, our panel, so yes, we and our audience yeah. can ask more questions about AI and the future of AI. Yeah, and I know we have a little more time. So, Kevin, do you have any final notes for the audience before your panel later this day? Um, what I would say is, you know, there's lots of other free courses um, that are on in, at the Deep Learning Institute. So if you go to courses.nvidia.com uh, without the, the other stuff in there, just courses.nvidia.com, um, you know, poke around in, in those, in those uh, self-paced online courses because there's stuff on, uh, you know, natural language processing, even cybersecurity, all sorts of things in there, some, some free ones. And uh, we have a whole bunch of other educator programs too. So if you get, if you know, if you're at university and you and you have a, a mentor, a faculty men mentor, um, we have all sorts of other things that we can do to help you get um, more training through the Deep Learning Institute. And uh, so you know, reach out to me. You got my email address, and I'm very happy to help all of you in your uh, in your journeys with AI going forward. I think that is absolutely amazing. Oh, yes. And so, yeah, thank you so much, Kevin, for being on our call today. We're super excited that you'll be back in a couple of hours for our <laughs> panel. And because this was an extremely fun, not only talk, but also a conversation at the end. And now we'll yeah. let you go and take a break before we talk with you more later. And then we've got a little bit of time before our next speaker. So two announcements here. The first is you can claim your learning badger at aka.ms forward slash GAI dash 
Badger. This is like your very own NFT that you can download to your own personal like wallet. I personally have an AI ambassador badge. My co-host Fatini also has multiple badgers. So it's a very awesome opportunity. We also once again want to remind you to that you can do our, I forgot the name. I'm so sorry. Our learn a challenge. So everyone who is watching the stream today can go participate in the learn challenge learn about different Microsoft Learn AI modules, and then you'll be on a leaderboard where you can see where you stand, but also complete it to learn more about the awesome parts of AI. And I think we'll take a short break before our next speaker comes on stage.